start recording. And so uh, welcome to the uh, the final showcase. So um, it's uh, I guess it's it's been just over three weeks and uh, six classes, and um, I hope you all have enjoyed it because I've learned I I learned a lot and um, I really enjoyed interacting with all of you. So thank you. And um, I guess we could go right into the presentations, right? The uh, the lessons. So who? So I I have a list like of you know of of the presentations people have submitted. So I you know I could just kind of start with the with the first one that's listed up there, or um, somebody want to volunteer? Sarah and I will go. Okay. So do you do you want does one of you want to present? Sir, are you able to pull up the screen? Yes, I Ooh. got it all working. <laughs> okay. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. So um let me see where you are. And are you already you're not yet a um co-host? Not yet, no. Okay. Uh but now I am. Now you are, right? Great, we'll do this one. Okay. Can everyone see a, a yeah, game board? We got it. We got it. Fabulous. Awesome. Great. Okay. Is it okay if I go first, Sarah, and then like we talked yep. about? Okay. Yeah. So Sarah and I made a game board, like an OODA loop game board. <laughs> and um, we kind of figured that this would be at the end of a unit where you had taught OODA loop to your class and problems, like what kinds of problems there are and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, there's like a lot of different ways you could use this. You could use this um, up on the screen where it's like teacher versus class. You could use it at table groups where there's like two kids on a team versus two kids. You could use it one-on-one. -on -one. You could send it home as homework and have parents print it out. Or you can print it and send it home and have parents work with their kids and their kids can teach their parents about it. Um, but basically it's a card game. And so we put everything on here and all you would have to do is print it and then um, double side the cards on printing and it's all ready to go. Wow. Yeah. So Sarah, do you <laughs> want to tell them about the game? Yeah. So um yeah, Lindsay gave a perfect introduction to it. Um, so we made a sheet uh, that has any materials you would need to acquire outside of this, like a dice or some form of like turn taking, whether you're like drawing numbers out of a hat or rolling a die or whatever you have. Uh, a game piece per player. It could be a paper clip. It could be an actual game piece, like whatever. Um, prep that you would have to do within this document to get the game up and running, and then the very basic steps of how to play. Um, so this is our game board. It's super simple. Each color represents a different style of color card that you would pull. Um, and then we have four different kinds of cards. So our purple cards are problem solving questions that are like real world for kids. Um, like, look at this picture, what kind of problem is it? So is it simple, chaotic, complex, complicated? Mm. Um, and then for you making the, making the game, each card has a number in the corner, very, very tiny, um, so that when you are printing it off, um, it goes double-sided to have the answer on the back. So you can either double-sided it, um, you know, right away off of your printer, or if you cut them out and put them together, the numbers match up. Um, so the, the purple ones are problem solving prob questions. Um, I'll admit Marin. Uh, and then um, the green ones are identifying situations. So like kind of a similar thing, um, but like what kind of situation is this? Uh, and then the answers are on the back there. And then real life application. So this would be them actually thinking of scenarios in their own lives that they've encountered and just talking through them if they drew these cards. So a couple just hand picked or like randomly picked, like talk about a time you encountered a complicated situation. How would you feel during a chaotic problem? 
Um, and then those answers will all vary, of course, because they're indiv independent or like individual to each um, player. And then the last set of cards are all OODA loop questions. So um, explaining the process of it, which part is missing out of these three, um, like what kinds of questions can you ask yourself in each step of the of the OODA loop? Uh, yeah, and then answers would be on the back there. Mm. And that's the whole game board. So it's it's kind of like Lindsay said, it would be like an end of unit game. So after you've done all of these, I presume, fabulous lessons that we're about to see, then you'd be able to like, play this game and like test your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than like giving them a test to see if they know it kind of. And we recognize that um, some of the answers could be different for you know, either different ages or just different kids um, based off of what we wrote on the back, but we just did the best we could of what we thought. So is it really okay for kids to have fun in school? No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> uh, I just, so it's it's a shame that Tammy isn't here right now because she would flip over this. Because I don't know, if you, you, you know that she's... Um, really the the you know one of the experts in the country on game-based learning really yes oh she, wow she gets called to speak actually she gets called to speak all over the world on game-based learning oh that's fabulous and she would she would absolutely flip over this I, and i i love it i like game-based learning too um <laughs> but this is uh yeah um what a way that's to funny. end you know and the units is to let the kids play. That's cool. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Any yeah, other comments? I'll stop share. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, I hope. Um, I think what what you know for some of you, if, if, if I can get your permission, I'd love to, to like clip off the portion of the video where you're describing this and then be able to show it to other teachers. Um, sure. yeah. okay. Um, that, cause you know, anyhow, thank you. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments for people? Any, cause I, I can really see this being used throughout elementary school and you know and probably even middle school right you know um yeah well i i was looking at the game board too and some of those questions are really going to foster like really deep and rich conversations so i think you could probably even use it at like a high school level you're mm -hmm. just gonna get different sorts of responses but like some of those like have you witnessed a chaotic situation like that's gonna that can lead to some really like profound conversations and building empathy, I think, with other students. Yeah. And Lindsay and I were also talking like, man, she and I could play <laughs> and <laughs> learn a ton yeah. about it. Um, but this, I, I think I put everyone, anyone who has a link as a viewer. Um, so feel free if you did want to use it in a different setting and you wanted to change some stuff up, like feel free to make a copy and like change it and do whatever you want. And wow. yeah, fun. the pictures are literally off Google. So <laughs> we're just borrowing them. <laughs> this is not uh, totally relevant to the feedback portion of this, but as far as the sharing of it. Mm -hmm. um, do you all know the really cool trick where you take off the word edit from the end of a URL and a Google Drive link, and then it forces the person to make a copy? It's really cool. So if you, uh, if this isn't too off topic, <laughs> if you open up a random document of yours, um, that, like, I didn't realize it was that easy, but um, up there at the very top in the URL of like a Google Doc, it'll have all of its are different you, Google Doc you... words. Courtney, can you share? Uh, do you, yeah. uh... I, I'll, um, let me pull up something that's not confidential. <laughs> oh, no, no. Go ahead. Go do confidential. We don't, you know, like, this is, those will just be on YouTube. <laughs> sure. Letters of rec for teachers and stuff. Totally right, cool. right. <laughs> um, all right. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yep. I always forget which screen on multiple screens it shows. Okay. So you have this Google Doc link. At the end, it says edit. If you just 
delete that word edit when I share it with someone. Let's see if I can, maybe this will work. Copy link, done. Um, let's see. Now do I know how to, okay, let me try to put it in yeah, chat just, maybe. Or just click click on the plus. Click on the plus. Uh, yes. Next to Gala Sponsorship, you, you see the, the plus on the browser? No, no, up, up above there, way up top. Plus. Oh, to the left, to the, yeah, to the left of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then just do control oh. V, right. I see. And just then, in case, I mean, yeah, my sponsorship thing is a little bit boring. Yeah. Is it not working? Maybe it, it might not be working. It may not be me. working for you because you're, um, yeah, it's your document. Yeah. Well, theoretically, if any of you want to try that document is, uh, you're welcome to click on my old sponsorship document from <laughs> last year. But um, did, let me know, did that work for you guys? It's a really cool thing when you're sharing yeah. things with people. Yeah, it's great. So little random tech moment. Thank you. Tech. Thank you. Yeah. Well, have I just invited myself to be the next presenter by speaking? <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> sure. If I'm not, is any, am I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I will share my screen again. And then I did it in like a power of Google slides thing. I can show my age by calling them PowerPoints. So uh, for a little context of this, I'm an assistant head at a little independent school, and we're really trying to take a more critical look at our reading curriculum, um, particularly the continuation from kindergarten through into third grade. Um, but, per, but really, we're in that same battle that you might have you know, talked about or heard about in a podcast like uh, Sold a Story or some of those other conversations right now about whole language versus um, phonics based. And we are at a spot where we've had a lot of staff turnover in the last few years, like many schools have. And so some of the, well, we've always just done it this way, reasons for doing it are kind of out the window. We have some fresh eyes and fresh ideas. So I'm trying to figure out how to facilitate a conversation that really my teachers are primarily leading um, or like they're exploring it on their own uh, to see what kind of conclusions or what kind of ideas we can get to. Um, my growth, I would say in this um, mind shift in class has been to really remind myself that there can be multiple right answers and that I don't have to have the answers before I present something to my colleagues. So I think that that's, um, you know, teachers fall into that trap too, thinking you have to know everything about the topic before you can ask your students about it. So that's that's kind of my translation here. So um, on my slide, I start with that really, you know, provocative, oh, I guess the setting for this um, will be an in-service meeting that we're having on April 10th. Um, after we come back from spring break, we have some structured in-service time and I'd like to work with our homeroom teachers um, through this PowerPoint. So. There's one best way to teach reading, starting with that provocative question, kind of getting people to start um, thinking, you know, right away about what their thought process is, what some of their biases might be, um, and then inviting the conversation from there. Um, one of the things that is really a nice benefit is we only have, let's see, that's only five teachers all together. So I'm not working with like a gymnasium full of a bunch of different educators, I can really have it be much more conversational. Um, so I'm wanting them to start by identifying some of those preconceived notions, like what are their assumptions that they're bringing into this? Um, and then what are they wanting to learn? Like, what are they, what are their wonders? Like, how are they wanting this conversation to go um, in the next steps? And so then I wanna uh, uh, share this format with them. Uh, this graphic I also just stole from Google. Uh, I did find a couple of really, let's see, I wonder if I can X out of presentation mode. So um, I found some interesting resources, not on this slide, I suppose, but there were some really good YouTube um, short clips, like especially those ones, you know, that kind of talk while they're drawing things. Um, that encapsulate some of this. And so I, I was trying to think of some other resources that could be valuable in that PD presentation point that's a little bit, it's you know, more visual, grabs the attention, but it's also kind of snappy. I didn't find a video I loved, 
um, particularly the ones that would apply directly to education settings. It felt like so many of them were um, very, you know, business, 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 leader, leader, leader kind of language. And that doesn't seem to fall, it doesn't seem to read as well for teachers. Um, and then the OODA loops, of course, I found a ton of like military things and police right. tactics that didn't really fit that either. So I didn't find a great short clip. If anyone comes across one, let me know. But I really wanted us to focus on the verbs and get that concept out of this slide too and showing the difference between um, what I want to narrow in on more is simple versus complicated and just sort of setting up that conversation um, where I'm sharing with them what that difference is. And then this feels like such an obvious thing when you see it like this, but um, also a big learning from this uh, for me has been the importance of identifying ahead of time and even just that slow down stopping spot of um, we're not going to just assume everybody is using the same terminology, the same vocabulary. We're not going to assume that everybody just gets it. Like actually identifying what a simple problem is versus a complicated problem is something that's beneficial, that was beneficial for me from this uh, experience. And then differentiating how we would approach solving and finding ideas and solutions to those. Um, down here, I have a link to a Harvard Business Review article that I found that I, I liked. It had a good, um, good short of short, you know, right to the point definitions of some of those and some different ways of approaching the language too as another variation. So by this point in the presentation, they would have heard me talk long enough and present information long enough. So I want them to turn in uh, small table groups um, to think about some examples of simple problems in teaching. Um, and then of course, the next one would be the complicated, oops, complicated problems in teaching and then give some time for sharing out. And then um, now that we have this other framework to approach this conversation from, I want us to circle back to that. Um, and the phrase implied decision was something that I thought would might, might be kind of useful because again, we make so many assumptions that we bring into these conversations. Um, teachers that have taught for 30 years have a very different um, set of experiences than our second year teachers. And so, um, even that loaded question of there's one best way to teach reading, um, I want them to think about, well, like, okay, if, if that's true, what's the decision that we have to make? And kind of push them a little bit that um, we don't have to make the right decision. We have to make a, a good decision based on um, what we that's have. Brilliant. Uh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, and I think that that's going to take, I know it takes pressure off of me uh, in this process, but I think it also will take pressure off of them. We have a particularly interesting dynamic where uh, the only teacher that returned from last year, uh, we had lots of shifts, um, is our teacher that has 30 plus years of experience in a doctorate. So everybody always just defers to her. And she's the one outlier in the approach she's using in her classroom to teach reading. So I feel like this is gonna help set the tone for conversation um, when we really focus on there can be multiple good decisions and they won't feel, I, I know I've had other teachers kind of mention like, well, I don't wanna go against what she does because it's so great. Right. So, you know, that social dynamic piece, I thought that would give them some permission. Um, and then I wanted to project these onto just a whiteboard for the conversation and have them um, you know, either come up on the whiteboard and write down um, or, you know, take notes on the conversation that we're having about it. Or one thing that I feel like works pretty effectively is often giving people a little stack of post-it notes. Um, I tend to recoil from things that are too standard canned PD approaches that we've all had in, in district settings. Um, but it does really invite more individual response. And hopefully I've set up a culture where that doesn't feel inauthentic. Um, so just really like trying to generate ideas right now is my main purpose for them. Um, and they're doing some really great, interesting things. Um, so I want them to also get a chance to really highlight their expertise, um, and explain just in a little bit of a snippet why they think that that's, that's worked for them, what they think that gives the kids. And then this is a, a spot that I might need to like help facilitate a little bit more with some gentle questioning um, in case there's any worry about how how people would feel like they're calling each other out. But 
Um, we're definitely seeing some problems that have come up at some different grade level spots. And then part of that is also in our communication with parents about our reading program. So I think those are naturally gonna come up, um, but I'll also be seeding that a little bit. And can you just and give then, an example of a problem of, yeah, without so, a teacher's um, name or anything, just a type of a problem? Right. Yeah, so we are uh, very much like a multiple intelligences, progressive education school, no standardized testing, lower stakes in the way that we talk about learning and achievement. And we're doing lots and lots of assessments, but we also do a lot of, you know, kids are gonna grow and develop at their own pace and we're gonna help support them and we're gonna identify any critical interventions, but we're not gonna be like, you have to be at level C by this time because everyone's different and everyone needs different things. Um, that messaging falls uh, a little bit short once we get to about second grade, where it's really that like rubber hits the road on literacy development. And we know that kids by the end of second grade really need to have a pretty firm found, firm understanding and ability to read fluently. Um, so what parents are hearing at the beginning of second grade is, yes, everyone develops at their own time. And man, this is a super important year and they have to do it this year. So right. there's been kind of this disconnect um, and we're a tuition based school. So then there's also sort of this um, marketing admissions hat view that that I have to bring to the conversation as well with how are we not serving our parents in the communication of our program? And is there something fundamentally going awry with our program or is it is it more about how we're presenting it? So those questions I'm hoping to pose and hoping to get some more concrete information on. Um, but I think also even just like how assessments are transferred from year to year. So again, with the turnover that we had, we haven't had some of the same procedures in place for communicating one year's growth to the next. So then teachers are feeling like they're kind of starting over again because they don't have all the context to go with the reports. And so that challenge is also something I think we need to address with a more aligned curriculum that we would all be using the same language. We would know how all these pieces lined up. Um, the great thing about having super creative, talented teachers is they have a million different ways to approach instruction. And the hard part about that is it can look kind of messy and it can look like instead of highly individualized, it looks like there's not a program. So trying to bridge that gap is some kind of difficult work right now. Um, and I want to really honor the fact that these are talented professionals. And so I want to, you know, get some brainstorming out there. Like, what do you think we need to be doing here and try to get everybody to, um, pitch in from their point of expertise because it's a complicated problem. And then, um, this is where I'm not quite sure exactly how this slide would work out. Um, but. By, my goal by the end of it is for us to go from, oh my gosh, we have 20 different things that we're thinking about to what's the one thing that we want to address. So also lowering the stakes a little bit. We don't have to throw out one whole curriculum and only decide to all adopt. That's not, not the purpose of this meeting and this conversation, but what's one thing that we could track and that could be measurable for us to be able to um, try out, um, to observe, um, and then to analyze and then act on that evidence. And so that's the problem of practice focus. Um, and I'm going to try my best to avoid a linear approach here. So I'm trying to just think about how many possible solutions and try to encourage them to throw out all solutions, like, you know, really lower that barrier to a good idea and just mm -hmm. be like, let's just spitball and see what comes out. Um, and then that's where I'm bringing in your work uh, mm -hmm. there and the quote that I used from one of your slides of just some of the agreements. And I feel like this is, uh, for this group especially, um, the idea of we need to obtain feedback from our actions. I want to get it a little bit more concrete for them, but then also the idea that we're going to do it many times. So it's not like a one and done, and then we have to make the ultimate decision. And maybe you won't really feel like it worked, but where I, I want to just sort of set them up for that um, shared understanding of the low stakes of a high stakes issue, but this process of thinking through is low stakes. And then try to get them to get a little, little bit more concrete with what we can be doing between now and the end of the school year. Um, and 
that's I, my little note at the bottom, you can see probably. So I want them to be really in charge of this and I want them to have ownership of those accountability pieces. Um, and I wanna make sure that we don't just stay in the iterative stage until next August and then we're at in-service again having the same questions. So um, I think mm -hmm. that with this particular group of folks that I have, um, we could make some agreements here that um, then on my side, my role is a bit more of those, you know, biweekly check-ins, put it on my calendar and make sure I'm asking how the process is going for folks. So, um, and that's where I want them to help create uh, basically a timeline of what we can do. And then with this block in here of basically like, what, what are they tasking me to do this summer? You know, when mm. I'm a 12 month employee, so what do you want me to do over the summer to get whatever is ready for you guys to come back in August? So um, I'm sorry, I feel like I took a really long time there. So I just, you know, like in my, my various jobs, it would, it, I just wish that I had bosses who had framed problems that way. It would be yeah. helpful. I think. I mean, it's new for me too to not be so black and white. You know, like uh -huh. we have to decide what the answer is and then move forward with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have a workplace that really supports that, and my own boss that doesn't expect me to, you know, do it uh, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, I'd love it if at some point, you know, after you try this out, if you could let me know how it work, how it goes. And the other thing is, is, is that having come up with that as a way to problem solve um, situations that schools are faced with, my own opinion is you should be presenting that to other schools because that's a great way for schools to get together to figure out how to solve problems, I think. Are you connected with NWAIS, the Northwest Association of Independent Schools? Um, I'm not, no. I, I should I should connect you there because we always there's you know great in services through the public uh, schools as well but that's a spot where um, it would be a great workshop for sure. Okay, well, just I'm not even saying for me I'm not saying for me to do it. I'm saying for you to do it. You should oh, be presenting to them because that's because <laughs> this is like this is the way I you know it's it for me you know and I'd love to hear from other people because to either agree or disagree but for me. This is the way school administrators and district administrators should be working with people to solve problems. And you put it together and you could talk about it. It's great. It's it's easier at a small school for sure. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a, a big privilege there. So other comments, other people? So, well, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so yeah, uh, okay. So let's move on. Um, let's see, um, who else, uh, let's see, um, Sherry, are you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Do you want to present? Sure. Let's see if I can do this screen share thing. Okay, can you see that? Perfect, yes. Okay, so the direction I went um, was how to OODA loop your conferences. Um, so I have parent-teacher conferences this week, um, actually tomorrow and the day following. And conferences is one of those situations where you get hit with a lot very quickly and things you say in those conferences, you know, affect your relationship with your families and your students and your classroom. Um, and so I've just found that in the past, like if I said yes to too many things, which I didn't in the beginning, um, in the <laughs> midst of the conference, that would have consequences and repercussions for my workload. Um, you know, if parents requested individualized things that would have consequences for, you know, my workload in my classroom and things like that. So I really wanted to sit down and think through and pre-think before I got to conferences. Um, and on the first page, what I did, um, 
Uh, first, I put a big note in all caps to skip to page two, busy people, um, because it's really a context for where this is coming from. But I was like, people are busy. If you just need to go to page two, go to page two. But the main gist of it was I was talking about three years ago when we closed in March 2020, I was in the middle of the long conferences day. Um Superintendent at the time came in to ask how many conferences I had completed and how many I had left. Um, and I told them, and then they went on to survey the next teacher. The next morning, we found out that closure was coming. Uh, lockdown was not in our vocabulary yet, but it soon would be. Um, and I have always remembered that moment as, wow did that just happen? The decision had been made on the state level. The superintendent certainly knew a couple of days ahead of time. And the decision made was keep doing what you're doing for the next couple of days. Finish these in-person conferences today, but we're going to cancel the conference block tomorrow. And you have four hours to create distance learning packets for six and seven year old children. Hmm. Wow. In utter disbelief and you know and i'm in the middle of all these in-person meetings and there's a lot that was unknown at the time um and so to me that moment was really a moment of the system of education and leadership utterly failing to adjust to the circuit an ice storm would shut us down immediately but an emergent pandemic they're like oh no 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 finish the week it's three more days mm -hmm. and honestly i just could not i still can't believe it um <laughs> that, the, that the system was so locked into we have to do what we have to do and what we've done in the past that I, it just felt to me that that was a moment that the system locked up and entrenched in what we always do yeah. um and I just, you know, I still to this day um, have a hard time believing that that was the decision that was made. We know this is coming. We know that we're going to close because of this situation, but go three more days. Um, so <laughs> that's this is kind of the context. And, you know, because it was three years ago and I'm in conferences tomorrow. Um, but so I decided to oodle loop my conferences or other meetings that you can't get out of. Um, I find in-person meetings, they can be helpful, but they can also be really adversarial. They can be really on the spot. They can be possibly the only times that my family set foot in the school. If they're not um, families that are able to come to events or other things, this may be the only time I see them come through the doors. I may not even recognize some of them, especially my multi-household kiddos. Um, I may not see some of these parents. And so this is like the one time uh, that I can see them. And so I kind of went through the process um, and you'll see those in purple, uh, like observe, like I thought about what has happened in conferences before, what caught me off guard or caused problems. And so I put them in a list. And this um, is exactly what, what Boyd would have done. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to see this. And I'm like, I said yes to everything, probably my first three, four years as a teacher. I don't do that anymore. And I learned the hard way um, because I ended up creating a lot of extra things. And if I didn't follow through and if I didn't maintain that, you know, if they thought, oh, my student gets a special packet every week, they would get angry at me. Now, I'm not saying don't prepare things for at home, but understand the load that you're taking on. And it, you know, might be overloading your workload. Um, I didn't set expectations. Um, I didn't set expectations for the time frame. We have 20 minutes and they're back to back. And I'm going to be speaking tomorrow for seven hours straight. Oof. I teach for four hours. I get 40 minutes for lunch. And then I got to go home and let my dog out. And then I talk for seven hours. So <laughs> this is another space that I really need to pre-think. I really need to prepare because it's like two to 220, 220 to 240, et cetera, et cetera. There's no break. There is no break. Um, and so, and also setting expectations for other 
people in the room. The siblings come with them. I have no problem with that, except when they turn my classroom into a racetrack and they start getting into materials and it it is chaotic. And I'm like, this is my space. This is a classroom. We are still at school, people. But it's 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 that weird twilight zone of evening where it is school, but it's not school. I'm not in charge of their children, but they might not be supervising their children, you know. So it's a very twilight zone um kind of thing, and it can be really awkward. Um and so what I did, um, you know, what did I learn from those experience uh, and what am I going to address now? And I made a note to be reasonable with your expectations and because I'm not going to solve every single thing right now, but I'm going to pick the important things and address them. And so I drafted a letter and I set expectations for the conferences and I will tell you the first few drafts were very sarcastic because I got to get it out of my system. And then I started going for diplomatic language and I really wanted to word things in a way that a reasonable person could not argue with it. So I tried to word things in the third person, like this is how it is. This is the expectation. Um, and so I included that letter. Um, for example, um, if you can't make your conference time, let me know. We will do our best to reschedule you, but please note that Friday is not available for conferences. We have a lot of families who want to schedule with me Friday afternoon. That is my only time to do report cards. And so I just, I said, and I kind of, I, I didn't say I won't do Friday afternoon. I said, we as a school, you know, if other teachers make exceptions, that's, that's okay, but you can't hold everybody to that because that is not what that time is set aside for um you know conferences are 20 minutes we have to stop and start on time we have to otherwise the entire schedule falls down like dominoes and the way we schedule our conferences is we have families with three and four and five children um and so we schedule family groups together so if they're late from mine, that delays the next four in their group. So it, it really falls down fast. Um, one of the things I said, and this was really hard to word, but again, I was trying to get to something that a reasonable person could not disagree with me with. And I said, remember that we are at school and everything that we are doing is being observed, heard, and imitated by your children and the expectation that is everyone is respectful to each other, even when they disagree. And that was my attempt to address um, the ways that people have talked to me about disagreeing with me, the way they talk about school, the way sometimes they start talking about other staff members in front of me, the way they talk to me in front of their child, uh, which puts me in a really difficult position um, because... I'm like, I wouldn't let a child speak to me like this, but you're modeling this for your child. And now I'm in the position of, am I going to try to correct you, an adult in front of your child? So I was just trying to come up with what can I say? What can I say that, you know, most of them maybe would understand? And I might even have it on the table and I might point to it. Because then I have a nonverbal of like, we talked about this, <laughs> you know, so without me being able to, you know, without even wording something, if I just maybe highlight that in yellow and point to it, maybe they'll pick up that verbal cue of how they're talking to me may not be appropriate. Um, and then I set some expectations for siblings and anyone with them. I'm like, you know. I expect you to use walking feet, use an inside voice, wear headphones, please. If you're gaming or videoing, I'm that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, please only get into the limited number of things that I will set out for you. And babies are exempt from the inside voice expectation and it's okay. 
you know, because I like to meet them. And so I was trying to put in a little humor in there too, um, because I have had parents get really flustered if they have a fussy baby. Um, But I'm like, no, it really doesn't bother me. Um, I hear about these babies from the siblings and I'll probably see them in about five or six years. So I'm like, it's totally okay. So trying to throw in a little bit of humor um, and a little bit of real life, Um, like it's not going to ruin your conference if your baby is fussy. It's totally, I have held babies during conferences with permission, I would add, um, (laughs) you know, so like we are human beings. It's okay. Um, and I felt really good about this and I sent it to my my principal and my principal's like, I really like that. And I'm like, okay, like (laughs) that's a good day. Um, so, and then I went on. So, so it's really how- practical things there in that letter. <laughs> and if you could tell it that came up from, okay, see, these are the things that went wrong. And uh-huh. these are the things that, you know, I mean, you know, trying them out, like, is this too sarcastic? Is this, um, <laughs> you know, does this put people off? Um, yeah, it, it, it's been refined well. <laughs> and then I thought about, okay, how am I going to adjust in the middle of a conference based on other things that have come up before? Um, you know, and so I did, I'm this chart here that I'm showing you issues that could come up issues that frequently come up. Um, and also these are the big ones and these are the most negative ones. Um, not to over-focus on the negative, but these are the ones that I feel in the moment, I need to have thought about it beforehand because these are the hard ones. If this catches you off guard, some of these, it can be really difficult in the moment to know how to respond. Um, So things that come up, my kid is being bullied. No, they're not. They're not. So, and then I will give them the actual definition of what bullying is. And then I will very quickly pivot to what happens socially with students at this level of development, because what they are calling bullying 99.9% of the time in first grade, in my experience, is social development with these kids. This is, you know, your kid poked my kid is not bullying. Your kid even doing it twice is not bullying. It happening for a month, I would have heard about it. Um, so things like it's the other kid's fault. Well, that kid has been mean to my kids since preschool. This is a very small town. People have memories. Um, and I have people that come into my class. Well, that kid, and they know the name. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about what's happening now. Um, you know, and let's talk about if that is even happening now, or if you're dredging something that is distracting us from our conversation. Um, things like, um, you don't help my kid. My kid has had this problem for months. And then we talk about, well, we learn how to exist in a group and we learn how to ask for help. And we learn how to talk to our classmates and there's 20 of them and one of me. And sometimes there's two of me. I have a really excellent, um, pair that's with me for a good portion of the day, but we talk about, I'm going to pivot to, you know, this is your child's chance to start advocating for themselves, to ask for help, to ask a classmate, not just me, for help. Um, and then also, too, I kind of clarify some things um, when the my kid has this problem every day. My kid is coming home weeping every day, saying they hate school. And then I'll be like, what time was it? Were they tired? Were they deflecting? And by that, I mean, were they in trouble for something else or were they trying to avoid going to bed or something? Because sometimes, I mean, they're six years old, you know, sometimes that happens. And also, you know, they, children will do what will work. And so if they under, if they figure out, if I tell my parent, uh, a kid was mean to me at school and their parents reaction goes like that. They understand that. Oh, like, ooh, I got a lot of reaction and a lot of attention for that. The kid, the, it works for them. If they're seeking attention and they say X thing, ah, I'm going to call your teacher. It works 
So we talk about that. We talk about when things happen, um, you know, and then I have the parents who, you know, they're like, I hated school. I like, uh, I hated school and they might, and that's true. And generally the note that I put was I'm going to ignore that unless I can't, if it just, if it's in passing once, because we have 20 minutes, we have 20 minutes. Um, if it's something they won't let go, I'm going to acknowledge that. Like, yeah, school can be difficult. I didn't like every school year I was in. Um, you know, let's talk about specifically when I might take away a recess because it's usually for safety problems um, and being out of control of your body. Um, you know, and so, and just so I've just really thought about these big ticket things of how I can respond to them and written them down. And I think that's going to help me have them like fresh in my mind of writing them down. And then I went on in terms of action. Um, when I talk to others um, about my conferences, um, I'll go to my other grade level teacher, my counselor, my principal, another staff. It depends on what the situation is. If I want to pre-talk something out, I will go to one or more or multiple of these people. If I'm bringing up retention, you bet I have had that conversation five times before I ever bring it to that family. And if I've been advised to wait and not do it at this conference and do it a month from now, you know, I will do that. Um, if I'm going to bring up, I would like your child tested for possible services in special education. That's a very sensitive, volatile topic. I've had it go both ways. I've had families be okay with it. And I've had families call me names for even suggesting it. So that's not another conversation I will have had several times before I, and I will go to the previous year's teacher. I'll go down to preschool um, and have that conversation too. So I get some context. Um, anything else I bring up with other staff, anything I know from prior years that is still happening. Um, anytime I need to check my perceptions, um, I've had families come in and, you know, they'll say something or, you know, maybe it's an actual safety issue. Maybe it's something that needs to be reported. Um, and then sometimes it's a cultural thing. I've had families come in with things that I don't understand. I'm a transplant here. I didn't grow up here. Um, and sometimes people reference things or have traditions or even just the way they're speaking, um, you know, and so I will go to my other teacher and I'm like, okay, this is what happened. I'm not sure my perception is, I don't think I have a full picture and they might tell me like, oh yeah, I had a student from that family and this is how they do X. This is, they go out of the state multiple times a year for cultural events. And that's why they're missing a month of school. Right. So, uh, it sounds, so, so it sounds to me like what you've been able to do is to kind of go through the types of issues that you, uh, the common ones and the really important ones that you mm -hmm. face. And by, you know, going through that OODA process, you're pretty well prepared, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and of course there's always new things that come up, but um but, the, you know, it's kind of a great modeling of how to uh, how to use UDA to, um, you know, to look at things that could happen or that have happened, um, mm -hmm. prepare for them. And so that you can react really quickly and you don't have to go into that long UDA loop of trying to figure out what to do. It's like, mm -hmm. you you know, it's, it's kind of second nature, right? Mm -hmm. This is great. Yeah. And then I just, you know, I, I wrote that, um, you know, I'm going to try to make some notes after conferences, even though after conferences, I kind of just want to collapse because spring right. break is next week. Um, and then, you know, there are things that I have to follow if it's big things like I really do at least need to send information out mm -hmm. um, or make notes, you know, that I need to as soon as I got get back from break, you know, follow up on services and things like that. Um, I identified a few gaps that I had. Um, I don't really do a lot of follow-up with my students 
uh, after conferences. Um, part of that's their memory. They don't remember if they had breakfast. Right. Um, and so <laughs> honestly, they don't remember anything said in the conference if they were there or not. Um, you know, but I used to use a primary friendly, like they would circle, like there would be a statement, I follow directions and then a happy and neutral and a sad face. And like, they would kind of evaluate themselves. And then I would put a circle in a different column. Um, so I have done things like that before. And so there's, there's some gaps that I could fill in later. Um, but again, we want to be realistic with our expectations and our work time. Um, and yeah, and then um oh yeah and in terms of sending emails out um i did i made one note that i thought was really important um that in my district at least everything we type on email is subject to a public records request mm -hmm. everything including when i am mm -hmm. drafting the email if i'm drafting in gmail it records every single line that i type so just as a you know, professional wow. thing, just as a security thing. If a parent requests every email containing their child's name or initials, everything that I have typed relating to that child, including the draft that I did not send can be handed over. Wow. Um, and so, and in fact, we even have, we have a care team where we go over, you know, cases and how we're going to support students and in interventions. It's come up that those files are also subject to public records request. And I'm like, well, that's going to change how I write those files because I thought those were internal only. And so just as a things I learned about the profession that I am going to keep in mind. And also I, I mentor uh, some other beginning year teachers. And this is a conversation that we are going to have um, just in terms of a, you know, this is something you need to be aware of and that you need to be thinking about. So. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting way of applying Buddha loops to a situation that, uh, you know, a lot of us face. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other observations, other thoughts? Hmm. People, I, I suspect that other people could use your list of things that are likely to happen in uh, teacher conferences and um, might help them to prepare also. I, you know, I, think, I think it's a helpful resource. So thank you. Sorry, my kid's crying, but... Oh, okay. I was, gonna, I was gonna say real quick. Conferences when I taught always stressed me out, and I would love to have just a list like that of like if this happens, then you know, try this. So I thought that was um that's a really good resource. I'll have to save it for when I go back. I think yeah, it'd be I like a that too. Just identifying problems that you've had and um, possible solutions. Yeah, I think it's the idea about taking some time at the end of the year to sort of do this for what something like looking ahead almost to in service time, you know, like year, like what was you know something that's kind of supporting them and being reflective and then making a concrete plan. I think um, I will use the same process for many things in my world that I swear I'm going to do better and differently next year. So thanks for the format. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see who else wants to present. I think um, is Val I, maybe, and Sarah. Can I go next? Yes, because I'm like a really fussy baby, and I think I need to maybe depart after I go. Okay. If that's okay. okay. Yeah. Or you like want put myself back on mute. <laughs> okay. So are you? So yeah, and you're? Are you a co-host or or? Let's see. I am not a co-host, and if you could do the screen sharing for me, that would be nice. Okay. Um. Let me. Let me pull it up. Okay, and here we go. Okay. So. Oops. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just pressed the wrong key as usual. There. Okay. Okay, so um, I was trying to figure out how I can use 
the problem solving with young children because that's kind of where I am in my mm-hmm. life right now. And I wasn't exactly sure until I watched the session one of the presentations. And there were a couple of things that stood out to me. I think it was Jesse who said something about how we need to make sure that we're explicitly teaching um, problem problem solving skills to kids. And I know when I was teaching, we had like the big three. I think it was a God thing, but it's um, show respect, make good decisions, solve problems. And so by the time the kids got to me in fifth grade, I was kind of like, okay, like you you know how to solve your problems at this point, like solve your problem. But, um, you know, and obviously like if they really didn't know or if it was like a big problem, I I would try and guide them. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, I wasn't very explicit in my instruction on how to solve problems. And I think I could have probably, you know, modeled a lot more. So um, anyways, this is kind of like just my overview. So I wanted to think about like OODA loops and how you could use it with younger kids to make sure that you're like explicitly teaching problem solving. Can you go on to the next slide? Sure. Okay, so I put kind of your your definition um, of observing. So you observe the situation. And then I think it was Linda who did like the synopsis of your whole class. Mm-hmm. And she just she just kind of like wrote out everything in really um, simplistic, like summary form of this whole session. And so her definition of observe was look at the problem. So with children, and this is targeted towards like preschool teachers or parents, um, with children, like look at the problem, they might need help calming down in order to be able to articulate the problem. So you might have to do like some breathing techniques, um, have them state the problem. They might need help stating the problem, such as like, you know, um, Susie pushed me down the slide today, or something along those lines. Um, discuss emotions. So you might have to model for them, like, oh, you're upset. you were busy playing and you didn't want to stop when mommy asked you to. It's frustrating to get interrupted. So, yeah, and you could use that for husbands too. You were busy playing and you didn't want to stop when your wife asked you to. Yeah, uh, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, so and then orient um, is to come up with possible solutions. So, like working with your child to come up with a list of ideas for possible solutions. Um, allow the free flow of information, no wrong ideas. Kids can have fun and be silly with it. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, So like for example, my kids, every time they go to the, the store with me, it's, oh, I want this, oh, I want this, I want this, you know, and, um, sometimes I'll play a game with them and like just kind of like okay so like what happens if you get that or like what would you do with that like you know I want a hundred pieces of candy what do you think would happen if you eat a hundred pieces of candy you know so just kind of like have fun with it and their their solutions and then try and come up with at least like five possible solutions yeah I love that And then choose a solution. So obviously you're working with the younger kids. So you'll probably have to like write up a list and work with your child to decide what solutions you both like and then cross out ideas that um, wouldn't work for you or wouldn't, you know, they don't like. So make it kind of a, a collaborative effort for both of you. And then do it so like keep your list handy and when you know that you're going to be like encountering a situation so for example every morning leaving my house in a timely manner is a production um so
So bringing out the list and saying, okay, this is what we agreed on. Let's try this. And since they particip participated in the solutions, it's more likely that they will cooperate. Um, but yeah, ag agency is pretty amazing, isn't it? When, yeah. 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 Uh, um, and then if it doesn't work either, like go back to your list and, you know, try another idea on your list or come up with more solutions together. Great. Yeah. And so while I was like looking through kind of problem solving with younger kids, um, so that obviously that's that's the OODA loop, but then there were some just ideas that I saw online um, to encourage problem solving. So like puzzles together, scavenger hunts, asking them open-ended questions, resisting the urge to provide the answer, model problem solving. So when you're solving your own problems, like making sure that your child's aware of it or other children are aware of it, um, allow children to make mistakes and let natural consequences unfold. Like sometimes I feel like such a bad parent because um, if my kids leave the house without a coat, I let them do it. But then there's other parents that are like, where's your coat? You can't go outside without a coat. And I'm just like, mm, okay. <laughs> I think they'll figure it out, you know, like it's a natural consequence. And I'm trying to let, for the most part, like let those unfold naturally. Um, but yeah, so anyways, that's it's, a, it's, that's it's a, great to let kids make mistakes that aren't going to really harm them, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, and that, you know, maybe harm them a little bit, but, you know, like it's like that's how they, become anti-fragile right yeah yeah but then sometimes you get looks and you feel kind of fragile right right yeah. <laughs> um and then let's see so reading stories like discuss the problems and different solutions in the story than like rather than like what the outcome is like so what if the prince didn't rescue the princess you know like mm. what could have happened and um mazes uh outdoor play letting kids do kind of risky play um gives them the chance to solve their own problems and then like toys that encourage building yeah these are some great opportunities to have the kids learn problem solving in a non-high stakes environment right doing yeah. puzzles scavenger hunts outdoor play mazes stuff like that yeah i i was um really into like reading about nature play and like nature schools and stuff like that. And I found it really interesting. Um, a, a lot of parents are really worried about the play structures and just kind of like stuff that kids do, you know, like climbing trees. And um, most of the time when kids get hurt from being on play structures or like doing things outside, it's because someone else helped them do it and got them into a situation that they can't get themselves out of mm. um, versus like they're more able to figure out their limitations if they're doing it by themselves. So for example, like my four-year-old, if she can't get to a branch on a tree, I'm not going to help her get to the branch on the tree. Um, but if she can do it by herself, good for her, you know, mm -hmm. and most of the injuries, a lot of injuries that occur are because kids were helped get into yep. that they helped you get into a more dangerous situation. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. That they couldn't handle. Yeah. 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 So that's really cool. Sorry, it's not fancy, guys. <laughs> no, but it's got the content, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a great way of introducing kids to a process personally, you know, that. Um, allows them to start making decisions and also kind of moves them to, to um, iterating through the decisions because, uh, you know, as you, you know, if it doesn't work um, the process of getting them to go through that process again, rather than like dwelling on uh, why it didn't work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Thanks. Any other Thank comments? You. I just want to say, I applaud your natural consequences. 
I love parents like you. <laughs> Honestly, I, I wish for more risky play and natural consequences. And I left my coat and somebody doesn't jump in and do it for me because I wish my students had a little more experience with that. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, Sarah, I just have to say also, I felt that as a mom. So I guess my big takeaway is I see you. I want you to know that. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I think um, Val, do you want to? I'm here. Yes. Okay. So um, I don't have you uh, as a uh, co-host yet, but um, I can make you co-host or if you want me to. No, go ahead. Make me a co-host. Okay. Well, should be your co-host now. All right. Here we go. All right, folks. So um, my, uh, 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 I teach at a school. I teach in a very unique environment. I've never taught at a school like this before where um, most of my students, well, most of the students here at the school um, get instruction one-on-one -on -one with teachers. Um, and um, and my particular situation is unique in that I don't have any classroom students at all. I, I have 45, 30-minute uh, appointments during the week. And one of the opportunities that I get to, uh, that I get to part participate in is working with seventh grade students and what we call um, an advisory role or a consulting as a consulting teacher. Um, where my job as a consulting teacher is to really just kind of help them navigate the school they're, they're, they're as a middle schooler, because it is a high school, so there's high school students here, and there's middle school students, and um, so I work with them on figuring out their grades, and if they're having issues with other, with peers, and, you know, and, and this is, I'm kind of like a counselor, but not really, I'm not, that's not my, my title is not as a counselor, but I'm kind of their first First place that they uh, they come to if there's an issue, um, and most of the time there's not an issue. And so, what do we do? We end up, you know, when I meet with them once a week for 30 minutes, and what do we do? We we um, we play a game, or we talk about the weekend, or we or we do uh, homework, or if we're missing homework, and we do that. Um, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to introduce to them some critical thinking and uh, kind of go through the the process with them. So. Um, this is uh, basically what I just told you, um, where we'll, we'll spend some time. I think I've got 30, uh, let's see, how about, about 30, 30, 25 to 30 minute sessions um, during the school year. And um, maybe we'll do 12 or 13 sessions where we'll be able to talk about problem solving, critical thinking, and um, that sort of thing. So kind of outline that in this, in this lesson plan. So our objective is to um, introduce the framework to the students using um, real-world problems. Um, students should be able to identify simple, complicated, complex, chaotic pro situations, and hopefully we'll be able to develop some, um, uh, some skills that we can uh, begin to combat um, at least the complicated problems. So to do that, what we're going to do is um, we're going to play games. We're going to um, we have two or three sessions where we'll play card games. We'll play gin or bridge or or spades or euchre. Um, these are all games, of course, that none of them know at, at gr grade seven. Um, maybe maybe one and maybe a hundred would know. But anyway, um, we'll play a session of tic tac toe. Um, we'll play a, we'll do a session of situational awareness, um, and then we'll do um, we'll talk about teenage problems, which is kind of the the culminating event um, of this of this lesson toward the end of the year, which. Um, and, and kind of my philosophy about working with students is that um, I want them to take what we're talking about outside of the classroom. Now, I teach math, and you know, for all of you who would would hear or or have said, when do we use this in the real world? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Very rarely do you actually end up having to um, solve a quadratic equation unless you end up being an engineer. Um, but what you are learning is the the uh, the process for uh, logically thinking through things. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is to try to uh, be provocative and have them think about their own thinking as they, um, as they go outside of my classroom. So um, 
The first thing we'll do is um, we'll do card game. So we'll present to them complicated issues. And this is where I, I, this would be a totally new thing for me. I would play it. We, I'd say, we're going to play a card game, but I'm not going to tell you the rules. Um, I'll answer whatever questions you have, but I'm not going to tell you what the rules are. And you just kind of have to figure them out. And I'd be very curious to see how they kind of go about doing that because um, anyway, like I said, I haven't done this before. Um, and so here are the, the students, idea, the student, the idea is to have the student kind of pull together resources for identifying, you know, if they ask me the game, what the name of the game is, of course, I'll tell them and they can go off and learn how to learn what the rules are when we come back and play the next time um, or not, just depends on how, how engaged they are in the, in the situation. Um, and then I want to, I want them to have a journal entry and I'll just ask them, you know, like, what was it like playing the game at first? And how did you feel? Were you happy, sad, scared, angry, or a combination of those? Um, what did you do to deal with, the, with those feelings? And next time you're faced with a new game, what might you do differently? And so then we'll get a chance perhaps to, to do another new game and see how they, they can kind of change how they approach. Um, here's a, a tic-tac-toe. We'll just play tic-tac-toe the whole session. And, and again, do a journal entry. Um, you know, what was it like playing the game at first? How did you feel? These are basically the same, the same um, uh, questions again. And then we'll, we'll do some cognitive framing where we just kind of talk about imagine you're in a classroom and in a school where there's never a fire drill, right? That doesn't ever, ever happen, but imagine it goes off and um, in your mind's eye, what do you see yourself doing? What do you see others, others doing? What's the worst thing that you might see someone else doing and how would you react to it? And how do others react to that? Um, so kind of getting them an idea of kind of how you to deal with some of these chaotic situations that occur um, and what we do to try to mitigate them as much as possible. Um, there's other situations that we could also talk about earthquakes, <laughs> volcano exploding in the Northwest. That's a real possibility. Um, active shooter, zombie apocalypse. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a journal entry that we'll do with this one as well, which are the situations we discussed today, which you feel most scared or anxious. Um, and what sort of things do we do as a family or as a school to try to survive these situations? So then we get into the complex situation um, <clears throat> where um, uh, this was the Pew Research did a, did a study to find out what, what is it the teenagers seem to think are the most important issues that they have. Um, and they seem to point to anxiety, depression, bullying, drug use, and alcohol use um, as the major problems that they have. And so, again, we'll have, I'll have them kind of, we'll talk about that, have discussions about that, and then have them pick a problem, one of these issues, and brainstorm about some potential solutions. And then, then we'll go into um, some top teenage issues you know, by this YouTube YouTuber, Miss Mojo. And, and these are the top 10 struggles that teens have. Um, number 10 is high school, and number one is puberty and hormones. And there's everything in between. Um, and what we're looking here is, is to identify, there's some of these issues, hopefully we'll be able to identify as complex and some of them as complicated. And um, I, I like Mitch's uh, description of, you know, how to tell the difference between, are you dealing with a complex situation or a, or a, 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 a complicated situation, um, you know, an air, building an airplane is very complex, right? But um, everything else that's very difficult, or maybe there's not situations that are things that you can figure out are going to be um, complicated. And in some of my reading online, there are people that get those mixed up. Um, and it's uh, so it, it, it's, Definitions of terms is, is seems to be pretty important here, and then um, and then we'll go into talking about how to solve some of the complex problems because those are the really the ones that we can have some impact on. Um, and I like the the um, quote that Mitch put in the reading about um, uh, Albert Einstein: "If I had an hour to face a seemingly intra intractable problem, I'd spend 55 minutes trying to think of the right question to ask." And that's what I want them to do is I want them to be thinking about the question that they want to ask to try to solve the problem. Um, I, I, one of the things that just rankles me about um, kind of the news media these days is that we try to boil down very, you know, complex problems into a black and white solution. 
And I want people, I want kids to understand that that you gotta, you gotta look at that and just say, there's just no way that that's going to happen. You cannot boil these, these homeless problems down, you know, people who are homeless into, you know, there's a solution to that. You know, all wouldn't that be is, cool if they could really understand that? Yes. That, yeah. That's kind of my, that's kind of my goal to, to doing this. Um, and so, and then there's, you know, I just have them selecting uh, uh, one of those salute problems that high schoolers uh, face and come up with one or two questions that they would try to ask to try to help solve this problem. And, and that's it. Thank you. It's really cool the way you have the kids actually confront the different problems that they're, um, or, or, or bring up, well, first of all, some non-stressful situations where they, they, they may put stress, you know, stress on themselves, like those games where they don't know the rules, mm -hmm. um, and think through how they might problem solve them and how they become more complicated, um, or maybe in respect, tic-tac-toe, even simple once you really know the rules and you and and you know the moves, and then um, relate that to the more complex problems that they that they face as teenagers, um, you know, and mo moving into adulthood, uh, right. and uh, you know, and and understand that the same problem solving techniques that they use and recognizing the type of problem are things that they can apply to these. I, I think that they could be very powerful. Yeah, I'm hoping so. I'm looking forward to giving it a try next year. Yeah, and I, you know, um, and uh, you know, if if you try it out, and I, I'd love to hear the results. And if you wanted to brainstorm with anybody, like this happened or this happened, you you know, you got my email and okay. contact information, and you know, I'd love to follow up. Awesome. Yeah, really cool. Any other questions? Any other co comments? I should say. I liked uh, you said thinking about your thinking. And the idea of playing a game and not telling them the rules, I just applaud you. That was awesome. Well, that's it. And that's really the only way I think that kids actually take this out of the classroom is when they have to think about what they're thinking about, you know, and, and you know, we did this in, in class, in Val's class today and blah, 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 blah. And I was wondering, you know, and that's, that's kind of exactly what it is that I want them to be taken away from it. And if one in 10 does that, then I feel like that's enough. That's success. Yeah, thank you. So I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to present. Um, it's not a requirement to present. Um, uh, so I don't, I, I think everybody who wanted to present did. Maybe even people who didn't want to present did. <laughs> um, any, um, so, so, uh, any last thoughts? Because we're 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 kind of done with the course. So, um, you know, I hope I expect that we'll do. Ha I'll have a well. There's a for those of you who have not taken mind shifting one. There's a course that begins in May, and then in the fall, we'll schedule at least one mind shifting one, a mind shifting two, and a mind shifting three class in the fall. Also, um, any um, any last questions? Anybody have? Uh, just a quick, one quick question, Mitch. The the spreadsheet that you uh, that we put our presentations on, um, mm -hmm. very very helpful. I'm wondering if how long we'll be able to access that, or should I download the people's stuff? Or so um, so I will not deliberately take that down. Okay. Okay. Um, what? Let me just check the share options. Um, what I will do is I will, in the next couple of weeks, in case there's more people who want to put up lessons, but in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to change it so that uh, people who have the link will be viewers, not editors, because they don't want somebody coming in who wasn't in the class or whatever, who perhaps get the link and and, and maybe makes, makes a change to it. So I will change to a viewer instead of an editor, but I won't take down the spreadsheet. Um, but of course... You know, you also have the right right now to just go in and do, you know, file, but you know, make a new file, you know, or duplicate the file and, and do that. Um, so those are those are a couple answers. Okay. Um, well, so I hope you all get a chance to 
uh, use this with kids, as you know, my goal is um, is to really give kids a better groundwork of how to understand how their brains work, understand how to problem solve and, and look at problems without feeling overly stressed or threatened or feeling they have to come up with one solution. And then in the, in the, the third course, the, the kids have a better understanding of how to work with people when people don't necessarily agree with you or when they oppose you. So those are the three courses. So um, you're free to use any of the material, um, you know, however you want to. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you have access to all the videos and you you need to, you know, if you want to use them yourself to do PD with other teachers or what, you know, you can, you're free to use the videos however you want to. I'll make a copy of this also. And so you'll, and I'll send this out to everybody as well. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Have a great rest of the school year. And, um, you know, uh, keep in touch with questions or comments or, you know, anything that you want to reach out to me. So, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.